Um, I'm going to talk about designing responsive websites in WordPress. And um, first of all, in public speaking, don't say anything negative about what you're about to say right at the start. I haven't run this through at all. I haven't typo checked any of the slides or anything like that. What you're about to see is what I managed to finish today. So just bear that in mind to be a little bit forgiving. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Max. You can talk to follow me on Twitter at Max Shelley. I am um, a front end developer and I actually work less in WordPress now over the last couple of months um, since we finished this project that I'm going to take you um, through. Um, so, if my memory is a little patchy on the project, it was a little while ago to be finished. The project that I was, that we're going to show you, is actually was working on with David over here. This is David, and uh, he was um, working on the code uh, with me um, and kind of training at the same time with us. Okay. Um, so the talk isn't necessarily just about how to do it; it's about the problems that we face with responsive web design. More specifically, the problems that we face with clients and responsive web design. If you're doing something just for you, that you have a lot of control over, um, you get a lot of advantages. As soon as you have to um, bring a client into that, you end up with a whole long list of, of problems. This is just the initial list. I just thought for two seconds about some of the problems that we had um, working with WordPress and responsive. Now, some of these are unspecific to responsive designs, uh, but they are just things that I don't like about WordPress particularly, just made a list, always handy to have one um, on hand. Um, we actually have a good solution to most of these, I'm going to focus on the responsive ones more than anything else. This is the client that we're looking at, the lovely Liz Lake Associates, they are a landscape architecture company. They design the bits in between buildings, that's my understanding of what they do and how that space feels and works and uh, um, what goes in it, what doesn't go in it, maybe plants, street furniture, anything like that. And they do a massive array of work. More specifically, this guy is Alan. Alan's awesome. Uh, he was our client contact on this, and uh, he let us do a, a quick talk and take us through the build. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the client and, and, and Alan buying into the, pro the project a little bit later on. My year nine science teacher told me that anything you do should put the conclusion at the beginning so that if you choose to zone out later on then you already know what the conclusion is in this talk. WordPress is not a great content management system for responsive layouts out of the box. How many of you have ever used WordPress as a content management system for a client? So most people here, but more than half of us. Um, it's not a great content management system out of the box anyway. Once you start putting responsive layouts on top of it, has anyone found any issues with responsive layouts and working with clients? One person over there. Um, and some people over here. I'm about to find out. You're about to find out. It's, 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 it's a world of joy. Um, I think there's personally actually room for a new tool there, but um, I don't have time to write it, so good luck to those that do. Um, this is actually true for most projects, but responsive projects especially. If you don't get them to understand what it is that you're trying to build, why it's a better, um, hopefully a better solution for them if it's appropriate. Um, if they don't understand the, the hurdles that you're about to place in front of them up front, you're just going to be in their way all the time and not actually trying to explain why it's a problem, how you can solve it, and how you can work together. We actually tried to solve that by using their own data to get them a little interested in this. Most clients don't look at their own analytics a lot, so when you can tell them some information about their audience, how the website that you're about to build is going to be more useful for them, they get way more interested, especially if you can tell them that it's going to make more money. Love that. Um, if you're working on responsive layouts, usually the rising mobile traffic for their site specifically, um, and for this client, the idea of this we're going to talk about images a lot, but the, the way that they can present their images, their photography, what they do, present that the best on any given screen. That was what sold it to them. If, if my work can look the best on any given screen, that's what I wanted to do. I don't want to have to make any compromises. Um, rest conclusions are content remains, this is just a personal one, the hardest thing. The buy-in that you have to get from day one for them to actually write good content write appropriate content, and all of the things that we ask a client to do when they are trying to run a large-scale um, landscape architecture company. For example, these guys have three offices, um, two or three offices. They work in Stansted and in Bristol. 
um, they're, they're excellent landscape architects. They don't want to spend their time worrying about SEO stuff, about um, authorship in Google, about how something looks when it's on a responsive layout, about the hierarchy of their content. They want us to take as much of that away as we can. We try, but it's very difficult because they have to have the final sign off on it. Um, it's understandable that it's an issue, but it is frustrating, and we haven't come up with a solution. Well, we'll show you how we kind of deal with that. This, every responsive talk in the history of the world so far, this is still a hassle. Um, I am skipping that slide quite quickly, but if you if you're about to work in responsive design at all, just start there. Um, this is about as standard a build as I have done in a really long time. This we finished. Uh, well, we actually haven't finished this build, but the actual build is done. We are here on this process. This is a, this is how I've run this through. There was very little about this build that was um, that kind of threw up anything too crazy. We knew what we were going to build on the way in um, after speaking to the client and doing this uh, initial work up here. Uh, I'll show you the steps that we went through, and we just dealt with kind of normal problems along the way. And now we're coming up the other end, and we're, we're doing some work with them on the live site just to finish it off. But um, there was nothing crazy that came out of it, and this is what I would call a very standard process for us these days. As a standard, I'd say that the standard process for us lasts exactly one build. It's standard for that build, and then you do the next one. It's pretty similar, but something in the middle will change dramatically. So let's take a look at the client stuff. Um, first, and then we'll look at the technical developer stuff. Um, we began by being shown um, competitors that they liked. So uh, just to put this in some context, uh, some of the sites were responsive and some weren't. Landscape architecture, fairly mixed bag when it comes to the internet. Pretty, some pretty good stuff, some pretty um, average stuff. Um, this is kind of um, a fairly standard layout. It's, just, it's obviously just so focused on images. Um, this was one of the responsive ones that hadn't gone up, so this actually looks great on a phone, um, but they didn't really plan for, uh, this was 1440 by 900, so that's not going to be uh, doing anything too crazy, but it just goes to show that you can't, it doesn't always work, just go mobile first, do you actually have to go up? Um, this one was one of my favourite ones, this is by design, this is not an accident, it's just a raw layout of some pictures, I love that, they just didn't, you know, just like, screw it, the pictures are good enough, uh, it's kind of like Tumblr, but I don't think they've ever added anything to it. So, um, and these are really great companies. I mean, they're just they're proper like landscape architects companies. Um, again, this grid of images and the way that they landed with a, with a um, navigation at the top was just a real a real standard. And we spoke to our client and uh, to to Alan and the team. They didn't want to deviate crazily from that because the images are what sells um, their product. This is uh, this is one of my favourite ones of those. Just really gorgeous imagery um, of what they've done. So we got a brief through. I'm going to sum the brief up in two words. That was it. Um, they actually sent us over some great uh, some resources for them, and we didn't have free reign here. There was some work that we did with them to make sure that uh, they were guidelines and things like this. And this is actually from my development environment. This is pretty much what we ended up with. Uh, this isn't the final thing. There are some changes going on at the moment, but um, it's just one massive image because they just sell their end product. They just um, they would have designed. Uh, all of these trees and the grass and the way they get together. Um, and the way that we got to that, they actually sent us their own design guidelines, so we didn't get to pick any of the typography, any of the colours. Um, the, we got to pick some of the things around those and kind of where they went, but we were actually handed a set of design guidelines to begin with and some existing resources. But we actually take that a little bit further, and this is one of the best things that we do for responsive layouts, is we actually create our own responsive design guidelines. This isn't a mobile view, it's just really zoomed out, but it is responsive. So this actually demonstrates, this is the, the colour palette, for example, um, in that piece of text at the top. Um, it's got every, uh, it's got H1s, H2s, H3s, H4s, P tags. Um, this is the different styles of images they could have, um, whether they were full width or contained, um, how we showed avatars, how we showed buttons, icons, uh, form elements. And it's all responsive in this. So before we had written one line of code in WordPress, we have a template for one of these, and we basically build this and show it to them. They get to see everything that we do. And they sign this off, not a PSD. They don't sign off the actual artwork or anything like that. Um, and as I said, we had some control over that. <coughs> then we move into this tool. Um, it's 
pretty much the only tool we use for content. We ended up with 77 Google Docs. Um, I don't know what the average is for anybody else. Um, is that a lot or a little? I wasn't sure. Uh, but we ended up with 77 Google Docs across the website, and they were all different formats. And the comments functionality is the most useful thing in the world because it allows you to have a conversation um, in the content at the same time, and it's free. And they, um, Alan was, I mentioned Alan was awesome. He actually really put in there. He wasn't used to using Google Docs, and Sam, who couldn't be here tonight, spent a lot of time with him training him on how to use it. It's a big overhead on the job, but it will save you all time. And as soon as you get that first Excel spreadsheet that has all the content in in 4,000 cells, you have to get into another tool of some description. That's actually a problem so big, so consistent, that there are actually whole tools based around this is just for content. This, is a, this costs like £80 a month just to run that one uh, app. Um, I think they have some smaller packages, but for a team it's quite expensive. But it's a consistent problem. Um, we don't use this, we use Google Docs. It's free, it's awesome, but people are reluctant to use it. Um, the other product that we use to get that design guideline um, up, and, up and running and, and come alive for them is Envision. Uh, Envision. I may as well have shares in Envision. I love, this is like my favourite thing in the whole world. Um, has, anyone ever, has anyone ever used this? Two, three people. Has anyone used it because I said how awesome it was? The rest of you should use this because of how awesome it is. It basically lets you create interactive mock-ups. There are loads of tools out there that do that. However, this one, I use the free package and still get so many uses out of it. It's just, uh, it's also really cheap. I think it's like $18 a month, uh, just about £12 or something like that. And they let you do some really cool stuff and basically build um, responsive, interactive um, wireframes or PSDs, or however high fidelity you want to go with your images, you can basically make them interactive without having to write a line of code. Uh, they now do animations for mobile and different things like that. Incredibly useful tool, um, well worth checking out. And that's pretty much all we had for the client. They were incredibly um, kind to us and let us bore them to death about why building a responsive site was going to be useful for them. And then they were like, okay, fine, we'll go and try and do some content for it. And we worked with them on that. Um, the developer stuff. If you can take the technical problems away, the client problems um, tended to be less serious. So Sam uh, dealt with the client side of things much more than I did, and we wanted to take the um, technical problems away so they didn't have to worry about them. Um, just a personal, I don't use off-the-shelf WordPress themes, all the code is bespoke, everything comes from a starting point that I've, that I've written. Um, it's not a, um, I haven't modified another theme or another template. Um, and images is, of course, the biggest problem with the developer stuff. Um, the client had previously been using Joomla, and already after the first few days of having access to the WordPress backend, they preferred it, they liked how lightweight it was. Um, but we don't give people access to the WordPress backend um, initially, and we're going to show you how we take that away in just a moment. But the initial feedback was, uh, we like how WordPress feels, and... Um, like I said, I think there's room for another tool that they would probably prefer more, but it doesn't exist yet. Um, so some technical implementation stuff. We use less. Does anyone here not use less or SAS? Does anyone just just do like normal CSS? I didn't know you were going to be the only person to put your hand up at that point. That was it. Um, so for everyone who uses less than SAS, um, this will probably be uh, overkill. Probably. But um, as you saw from the design guide, that they have a massive color palette. Their technique uh, is to associate a colour with each discipline that they work in. That worked fine when they only had a few disciplines to begin with. They're now a massive company and have like 19 different things that they do. And as such, they deal with uh, infrastructure projects, different gardens, retail, leisure, public. And um, let's let us use variables for that and do some really cool stuff in CSS. And, and it made changing these a lot easier. They actually did change a couple because of the way they appeared online. So even though we had some design guidelines, they were pretty flexible with them. Um, and David wrote this code up rather than me, so he had to deal with keeping them all maintained and it being the right colour. So well done. <laughs> um, let's let us keep our viewports um, fairly flexible. We actually give a tool that we use for responsive builds. Um, 
I know that Anders specifically hates having fixed defined viewports before you start. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it myself, but with a client project you have to pick your battles. Um, and we didn't have, um, we weren't going to be bespoking everything. And we'll come on to how we kind of built something, built a tool for that. So we actually define these as less variables and we use these through the system. These actually come from, um, they're basically uh, iOS devices, for one of the better words. This is um, Kindle. A Nexus 7 and up um, iPad, and just they're really generic ones. Not, not a great solution, but less helped us. <coughs> Less's best value for me was the um, uh, the mix-ins. So, for example, we had a problem with um, wanting to show all the brand colors as a semi-transparent overlay with white text. So we couldn't. We only had the value as a hexer originally, but um, suddenly using Less, you can get an RGBA value from a hex value. Um, and then you can pass in an opacity on the fly and suddenly with one mix in you can control uh, how things are appearing um, which is really, really handy if you're, if you're not doing anything like that. Um, I actually don't use less anymore, <laughs> that's the last piece of less I wrote. Um, I use SAS. I am doing that mainly because I'm working in Ruby these days. Um, less is really great if you're trying to pick which to use. I prefer that less makes every class um, you can use it as a class immediately. So if I decide, if I define a CSS class, I can just call it. Um, so I have dot button. I can just use dot button um, in another class, and it will just work straight away. SAS has at extend for that. At include. SAS has a way of doing that somehow, um, but it has an issue with doing it inside media queries. So I find SAS um, has some shortcomings, but it then does provide placeholders to deal with that. So. Um, just pick your favorite one. Uh, the other technical tool that we use for client stuff, I love Markdown. Um, I really, really love it. And it has just been put into WordPress core, this version. So up until now, if you wanted to work in Markdown in WordPress, you had to actually put a plugin in. Um, and we actually had to, to hack it into this build. Um, but it's now in core. So you can just write in, Word, in Markdown in WordPress, and it will just spit out perfect HTML. It'll spit out HTML. Um, once someone, has, uh, once someone has saved that post. Um, there's some great Markdown cheat sheets. If you're working with clients, the leap from responsive to Markdown, by the time you're here, the client is staring at you with glazed eyes thinking, what are you asking me to do? This is basically code. Um, for those who aren't familiar with Markdown, it's um, essentially placing asterisks and underlines. You've all used Stack Overflow or other GitHub uses its own flavor of Markdown. Um, you're basically asking your client to write differently in content they're already not too sure about writing. Um, Alan sent us an email recently and he loves Markdown now. He's so happy with it, but he is now like six weeks into doing his content, if not more, so it's taken that long. Um, it's worth it if you're willing to stick with it and stick with them. Uh, there's a tool, tool called Dingus. Don't know why they called it that, but it's an awesome name. Uh, and it lets you practice. Um, it just lets you practice uh, writing Markdown and getting the content um, spitting out and looking right in the right formatting. Again, this is another consistent problem alongside images. How do you deal with navigation? Um, I did a talk, I think at IPROG, about um, responsive navigation and, and linked to this post, which is from Brad Frost, about responsive nav patterns. So many new navigation patterns have cropped up in responsive design that he's now written complex navigation patterns for responsive design, as if the original ones were really simple. They weren't. Um, there are seeing new ones of these every day about how do you get a fairly complex navigation structure to work on a mobile phone in the browser from a content management system. How many levels of hierarchy, how long, there are so many things that you don't know about what the client is going to do with their content. The content that they sign off once the site has gone live is not what's going to be there in three months, six months or anything like that. They might just strip it all out and your code has to react to that well enough or they might add 10 more sections in on a mobile device and your code has to react to that and it's not great. Um, the menu system in WordPress is actually really good but it is confusing for users again. May as well sum this entire talk up because training your users is hard. Um, there's a really great menu system. It's actually totally independent of the way that you create pages. So you can create five pages 
and then add them to a new menu in different orders and add them as sub-menus. They don't, all have, they don't have to match the hierarchy of the content. The menus can have their own hierarchy. It's really cool until you try and explain that to a client who then goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. And your responsive code also has to deal with that. Um, so we actually went with a toggle um, method. So I'm going to show you this. So this is, you see the, con uh, the navigation up here, home, what we do, projects. Our team practice will contact us. And this is the same on mobile. So we've got a little hide, and probably can't see this too well. There's a little hide toggle, and then as you tap that, the menu will slide back up and it will show and it will hide down. And you're thinking, oh, Max, why are all of these on the left? That's stupid. Why not make them larger and move them to the middle where they're easier to press? Well, the logic is, is that we wanted to provide at least one level of sub navigation. So if you actually have any pages underneath these, so underneath projects, for example, uh, it would actually load up on the right hand side. And if I wrote all the code, it's dead snazzy, works. And then the client took out all of the children pages, so now there are no children pages. So we had a conversation with the client and said, right, I can strip that code out, and you can never have children pages, or we can just leave them on the left, and then should you ever decide to change your mind again, we can have that navigation pattern there for you to use in the future, and you can add those sub pages back in. And Alan said, I don't know what you're talking about. And so we left it like that for now so that they can add more children pages back in should they need to. Um, the pattern here, uh, I'll show you a demo later on, is that the navigation at the top is actually, um, it will stick to the top of the browser as they scroll down. Um, and if that has some navigation, it's based on hover. So I'll show you a demo of that later on. So that's it. This is the other thing I may as well have shares in. Uh, if you don't use advanced custom fields with WordPress, but you do do custom development with WordPress, you're pretty crazy because this makes it work. This is the most useful thing that anyone has ever produced for WordPress, in my opinion. Um, you have to have a screenshot of the website because otherwise people don't know what you're talking about. That's how these work. Um, so we use this in two different ways. We use it as a, um, essentially a, an, extensible mark, an extensible page builder, uh, which we'll show you in a second. But it actually means that we have no default WordPress code in our WordPress templates. I essentially use WordPress as just a thing to let them put some content in and then it spits it back out. Um, Word, um, advanced custom fields powers all of our template rendering, or everything. Um, WordPress normally uses the content. Um, my favourite one is when the client put in loads of tables uh, into the content, so they click the table button and they generate tables because they're so used to working in tables, and then they put that in a responsive layout and then it's this wide and then they look on a mobile phone, but because it's a table, it's all broken. Um, we basically just take that out altogether. Um, we give them a list of fields that they can fill in. So for example, if you take Liz Lake and they have a project, um, we worked with them to work out a list of fields that would be consistent to a project. So it would have a title, it would have some pictures, it would have some content, the way they approached it. It would have some team members that had worked on it, it would have some other information. They can fill that information in per, um, per project and it will, it will save it and it will render out responsibly correctly. They don't have full formatting control. We give them limited markdown in places. That's one of the hardest conversations you have to have with the client and during the build when they say, I want to do this. And the conversation is fairly short where you say, no. And they go, but it's my website. I can have what I wish. And you say, remember that conversation we had in the first meeting where I said, you won't be able to have everything you want. Um, but they were really good about it and they, they understood totally. You're probably thinking, that sounds like a fairly basic functionality for a content management system to do. I want to show a list of fields for a type of page. I would like to show that list of fields and then have them fill it in and render it out. Yeah, I would think that too. And then you should try using WordPress because they do not agree with you. That is, that's required many years to get us to this stage of WordPress. Um, so basically every page in this entire build has its own advanced custom fields. And if you are familiar with the WordPress structure in any way, this database screenshot probably won't look unfamiliar. WordPress basically has two things. It has a posts table, which is everything. It's not just post, it's just anything that happens to have any data, and then it has a post meta. And advanced custom fields is, is incredibly cool. It uses like serialized arrays and like pointers and different things like this. It uses some really cool stuff to, to basically make WordPress work. By the time you're ever looking at this, if you're debugging this stuff, you've got a problem by this point. Um, it, 
If it works, it's really impressive, but when it doesn't work, as I was checking with Rob earlier on, uh, it can actually um, create some issues for you. It is a mature ecosystem, it's more reliable than I'd say about 90% of the other WordPress plugins I've ever used. Uh, it's well documented and maintained, um, and it is open source. For example, it doesn't work with Markdown at the box, I had to go in and modify um, advanced customers to work with Markdown, but because it's open source, you can just go in there, hack it around a little bit and it will work. Um, but this is really why we use it. It doesn't just let you define a list of fields for every page type. So for example, you had a project, here are the things that are associated with the project, and then you fill them in. It has these extra add-ons called repeater fields and flexible fields. And they are, my note on this slide says, try and describe these, good luck. Um, <laughs> you can basically assign some layouts, and each layout can have any number of fields of any number of types. So you might decide to have, I am going to run a demo, so if this doesn't make any sense, there is a demo. Um, you can assign, say, three or four fields that represent a paragraph, maybe three or four that represent a certain uh, picture or a different layout that you want. Once you've assigned these in advanced custom fields, the client can then pick and choose how they want these to be laid out, they can drag and drop them, um, and all of the fields can be of different types. If you've never used WordPress in Angular as a content management system before, that might not sound too impressive. It's actually a fairly standard thing um, within other content management systems. But within WordPress, it's actually pretty, pretty incredible, considering what WordPress was. Um, if, you <laughs> if you actually try and do anything too complex, your code gets really messy. Each of these is, is actually the way that WordPress does um, like essentially partials. You, you're basically just saying call template path, go and get some other stuff. Uh, each of those blocks is a different type of layout that I want to use in my code. Each of those contains other things. It gets really messy really fast. For me, working WordPress sometimes feels a little hacky. The structure never feels great. We use this alongside a tool called Gridset, um, which creates um, CSS responsive grids for us and lets us have a 12 column layout at certain viewport sizes and then gives us different numbers of columns as we go down. And it just lets us assign uh, CSS classes, rather than having to go in and assign all of the um, CSS ourselves, it basically, for example, would give us uh, T1 to T6, would give you um, six columns on a tablet layout. Um, it's a fairly intricate system, but it does work very well, and I would only really use this on client-facing stuff, because I don't know what they're going to do in their layout. I have to give them some very strict parameters for them to follow on a responsive layout. On anything more bespoke, uh, that we've been working on lately, um, this produces a lot of code. In order to give you the number of variables you need in CSS, it just gives you a lot of code. When you add all of that together, um, you face the problem, as I said, with navigation and things like that. We don't know what the client's going to need in six months. One of the other approaches is to just do the templates that they need and not do anything else. Um, and then charge them for more templates when they need those. I didn't think that was a really great idea, so we basically um, we built an extensible template builder with advanced custom fields. And I really hope that that makes sense. I'm going to run a demo, because what better way to end a talk that was prepared only earlier today than with a live demo? <laughs> um, okay, so the logic being that I should be able to press this and get this set up. So this is the actual, uh, this is actually our staging area for it. And, uh, you see that the navigation across the top um, fixes uh, to the top of the page. This, for example, is the, um, the semi-opaque brand colors that they have. Um, each, of these, uh, each of these is represented by the color of uh, that specific um, <coughs> that, that type of landscape architecture that they do. So, let's see if we can actually make this happen. This is, for those who recognize it, the screen is really small, so it, I'm really glad that the back end of WordPress is now responsive, so it actually is functional and works. Um, this is us adding a new page. Normal WordPress up here. Normal WordPress here. And then we get to this. Uh, get to the first one out. And there's no WYSIWYG. So we take away all WYSIWYGs all together. Because anyone who's used WordPress will know that you normally just get a page title, and then you just get a WYSIWYG at that point. We take all that stuff away. The client who's never used WordPress before has never seen that part of WordPress. We never gave them a version where that was an option, so they don't know that WordPress works in any other way. Um, 
what we have is because of our flexible layouts, we've given them this block system. And we have defined everything about this. So as I click add new block, um, I have defined what a paragraph is. Uh, paragraphs, that's where they can add more than one. Um, paragraph of video, one sentence image, social share. And this is my dev environment, so each client will have different sets of blocks. Um, so if I go and add some paragraphs, it's quite small, so this is going to get long really quickly. It's easier to see on a normal, uh, normal page. So this is, um, this is advanced custom fields at work, and it allows, so this is a paragraph on the left, and these are all of the things that we can do with that paragraph. Again, I have asked all of these questions for each paragraph. It's nothing to do with WordPress. We've assigned, assigned these. So we have image, um, how we decide that the image is going to align, uh, the heading, the content, uh, that actually uses markdown, um, the image and the content. And we can do some pretty cool stuff like adding more paragraphs in, and what this lets us do is, I'm going to try and actually, it's my development environment, but I'm actually going to try and do this, uh, see if we can get this to work. If it works, it'd be a bit of a miracle. Uh, uh, we can do paragraph heading. Uh, so we'll do paragraph one, um, paragraph one content, and then we should have paragraph two. Paragraph two content. I oh, write some pretty great web content. If you're very interested, um, we offer them options like the heading, color. Um, one of the problems that you often get with client um, content management systems, anywhere where there allows a WYSIWYG, they can pick their own colors. Um, they never pick the right colors. We take that problem away by forcing them to pick their primary color, their secondary color, their ancillary color. They are told what those are, and then that's all the options they get. Almost everything we do is to take things away from the client in their own best interest because you regularly end up with client websites in six months that have different reds or blues and just different things all over the place. Um, we do things like where we ask them if we'd like to force the image to have a maximum height um, and if we do, what's the height of it? Most clients don't actually use these features that much but they're all there if they like them to um, and we can use a custom margin. I'm going to take a massive um, call this test page massive gamble and hope this works, so I'll publish that. Should actually be able to view that page. Okay, so we have paragraph one, and paragraph two, um, and they should wrap around underneath each other. Paragraph one, paragraph two. And they can add some pretty cool content in there, as I said, they have marked out. But what we can also do now is just drop in and let them just add in their next paragraph. simplistic example, but if you imagine all the different layouts we give them, um, so we call this a three up, or they can have um, a four up, they can put images at the top and bottom, and then give them custom margins. All they then have to do is come in to the same editor, and then click add new block, and suddenly they can add one sense of image. Before you know it, they've actually got a fully extensible page builder where they can put in three ups and paragraphs and move them around. All of these are drag and droppable, so for example here I have my one centered image, and I have my paragraphs, but I can just move one above the other, and they'll be rendered out on the page in a different order. So Advanced Custom Fields is taking care of all of that for us, and all we care about is um, how they're styled at the other end. And it lets the client do some really cool stuff. Most of the time they don't, um, and they don't need to, because your templates or our templates have usually covered their main needs, um, but, so for example, if I find a, um, this is my development environment, so all the projects will probably have broken images. Actually, I've got the staging one up here, so we should have some nicer pictures here. Um, so this is a custom layout, for example, they can add their own text in. Um, well, that's really large next to me. Uh, and they can put in all their nice words about it, nice pictures, retro stuff about that. Um, they have a team that works on it. Uh, and again, this is all pulled from, um, from these advanced custom fields from different pages. Uh, we have a map, again it's totally responsive so it will uh, scale down as the screen comes down and then related projects that I can drop through to uh, and a nice call to action at the bottom in case we want to uh, have them do stuff. 
And that is basically how we use, if I scale that down, hopefully, if you have the mobile version uh, with the menu. Um, one of the, just on a final note, if you are doing um, navigation, one of the issues we did have is that if this drop down gets any longer, older, crappier mobile screens with really small resolutions, the scrolling it goes off the bottom and you can't to get to the items on the bottom. So the, the reason that they have this number of navigation items is because we couldn't give them any more reliably. Um, another thing to think about is um, contacting them. Um, one of the most common things is the contact us, but when you're on a mobile, you usually just want their phone number. So we actually added in a different navigation uh, toggle for them, um, which just lets people just grab the phone number, which will obviously be highlighted on a mobile device um, quite simply. Um, and that's it. That's the build, pretty much. Um, and how we use advanced custom fields. So thank you very much for listening. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, um, have you uh, ex explored you just using custom prototypes and defining your own fields in that respect before using advanced custom fields, or have you just jumped? Have you just jumped straight in? I jumped straight into advanced custom fields. The custom post types um, I have used on um, other themes um, and I hadn't had good experiences with them, but I'd already used advanced custom fields and had really good experiences. So it was, it was probably a lack of research about the custom post types. I should imagine they could probably be implemented very well. I'd only seen them implemented fairly badly and I just, uh, by that point, had trusted advanced custom fields so much um, this, as I said, was built on a starting point of a code base that I'd already built uh, and had already been running at a semi-similar scale, so I'd, I had full confidence in it before I went in. But I'm sure you could do it the other way around. You said earlier on it was going to be big images, you've got loads and loads of big yep. images, but how did you handle it for the mobile ones? Do you set up the same ones but just scale them, or do you...? Make loads. Make loads. Every image that gets uploaded makes nine separate versions. Um, the logic being that the client is only ever going to have X number of projects, X number of blog posts, their server hosting packages, although slow because it's from a crappy provider, uh, a not great provider, um, space isn't an issue. Um, and WordPress lets you render new images on the fly, so we actually grab uh, different images as you go through and the re renders. I think we do for large cover images. Um, I can't remember where we pull, so if I go to projects, for example. Um, we pull mobile ones here, and then we pull different ones on desktop. So we did it, we did it based on how big we thought the large one was going to be. The, the solution, not solution, the compromise that we use is to render lots of them. Not a great solution, but until there's a better way. Is that in CSS? Sorry. Is that in CSS defined? Yeah. The yeah. We, um, uh, I think that's why we ended up doing it in um, certain places and not others because we of the amount of control we had by CSS versus what they've done. So those background images, are they? Um, no, I think we actually use, um, n n we actually control some of them as background images in CSS and some of them in the content management system because we define advanced custom fields when you define an image field lets you have access to all of the ones because you just get back a WordPress image object so you get um, an object that gives you access to all the sizes um, and so we actually call the appropriate size based on based on our best guess of what we're rendering out so it's a mixture of the two, the two. Um, not, not just to clarify, not the best solution by any, by any stretch but we had to pick up that. Pick How long did it take? Whole like the whole process for a meeting client to deliver in time. David, how long did it take? Um, I think I was working with you for about two and a half, three months. About two and a half, three months, yeah. Um, about two and a half, three months, I'd oh, say. And um, we're not done. Um, alas, as I pointed out, we've basically. I'm a huge fan of pushing things. Their volume on um, this website of traffic visits is not huge. It's like a normal client website. They have a consistent but not massive traffic. Uh, through flow. So what we've done is once the content, they were happy with it, the site was usable. Um, I like pushing things live, seeing how people use them and then making changes rather than just making guesses. So the site is up and works and it's functional. Um, Google is indexing at the moment and is now reporting back through Webmaster Tools. 
Um, and so I'll go back, fix some bugs that have been found, one of which you found, um, and make some changes that the client has requested, and then give them feedback on the content they've put in. But the initial part, yeah, probably two months. And it wasn't, we weren't working on this full time, so uh, it was probably maybe two, three days a week at that, that point ish. Back to your images, Max. Um, retina displays, how you cope with retina? Is that just one of the. the yeah, we the do. That you're uploading? Um, no, we basically. What I do for retina is, I don't think we're doing anything for retina specifically here, is um, I normally do um, take the normal one and just show it half the size of CSS. I don't think we do anything special for retina here at all. They're so massive originally. For, so for example, on the home page that's live, um, the, the page size is pretty good. We kept it down to like, I think is okay, it's about two to two and a half meg. Um, but the, it does a three massive image carousel, which I couldn't talk them out of. Um, so the, the, they're, it, they're massive. Um, I think we put them up at like eleven seventy, maybe maybe higher. Um, I I work on retina all day, and it was it was okay. I I, I wasn't I didn't feel too bad about it. Um, but when the new is it source set the new uh, the, the the HTML five stuff coming through forever, we'll, we'll use that and, and use it properly. But um, didn't didn't go too far down the road. It's just too big. Thank you very much. I hope that was useful. Yeah. Some people yeah.